I really appreciate this prize and I'm deeply honored to getting this award. And unfortunately, I can't, be, uh, I can't attend this session, but I was here two days ago and I'm now recording for you the presentation that I wanted to give on, on Wednesday afternoon. I was asked to uh, give a presentation on the work that we've been done, we've been doing on milk protein and muscle maintenance in the elderly population. My group, my research group, focus on, so focuses on skeletal muscle tissue. And why skeletal muscle tissue? Because it has such a tremendous plasticity. And with plasticity, I mean the capacity to adapt to different uh, exercise or environment or the use of muscle. And I can show you very difficult graphs of, of um, molecular plants, but I think this picture is actually most clearest. You actually see two athletes here that allow themselves to adapt to that type of training. And we call that muscle reconditioning. And of course, you have one athlete on the left who is actually adapted to endurance type exercise. And you have a person on the right who is clearly adapted to resistance type exercise. And it's beautiful to see that the muscle can actually adapt to different types of exercise. That's the good part. The bad part is we can also adapt to bad lifestyle behavior. So not exercise, but for example, uh, not enough exercise or sedentary behavior. And as you can see on this, this slide, this cartoon, is that our TVs have, begin, have become thinner, but people have become much more obese. So what happens if you adapt to a uh, sedentary lifestyle? You actually get not muscle reconditioning, but muscle deconditioning. And muscle deconditioning we see in different uh, different conditions like immobilization when you have your arm in a cast or your leg you actually see a lot of muscle loss after only a few weeks and of course muscle loss with aging called sarcopenia is also something that we see every day and also in various disease states like cancer cachexia chronic obstructive pulmonary disease type 2 diabetes and a lot of cardiovascular disease states we see a, a rapid muscle loss with these patients so going back to healthy aging or a normal, normal healthy lifestyle, we see over our lifespan, and what you can see here over the lifespan, we're going from, from 10 to 20 to up to 80 years of age, we see that muscle mass declines over our lifespan. At around 10 to 20 years of age, about 50% of our total, muscle ma our total body weight is actually muscle mass, 50%. But that declines over, the, over, over, the, over our life to down to 50%. And that's a massive loss of muscle. You don't always see this from the inside. However, if you look at this picture, you see the cross-section, uh, cross-sectional area of the upper leg in a young person and an older person, not even an old person, 61 here. And even though these people have the same BMI, you clearly see in gray that there's much less muscle in the older person than in the younger person. And it's obvious that in white, you actually see much more fat subdermal fat under the skin, but also fat between the different muscle groups. Now, if you also take muscle biopsies from the, that leg, you see all more interesting things. You see that specifically the type 2 fibers become smaller. And these were the ones that you actually need to produce force. And we see that fiber, fiber types start grouping, and we see some fiber, there's some suggestions that there's fiber loss. So, this loss of, of muscle and the changes in the muscle quality leads to loss of muscle strength. And in this graph, you actually see there's a quite a strong relation between muscle mass and muscle strength. In other words, if somebody looks really big, he's generally also quite strong. But the muscle loss that we see with aging also leads to muscle strength loss. This translates to the loss of functional capacity, and that leads to a higher uh, likelihood of developing chronic metabolic disease. And of course, all these factors reduce the quality of life. The big question is, what regulates muscle maintenance? And that's an interesting question, and I can't answer it for you. But I can give you some hints. Our skeletal muscle tissue is dynamic. And a lot of people don't realize that our muscle turns over at a rate of 1 to 2 percent per day. What does that mean? I would like to ask you all, I can't check it, but please look at your own right arm. Just look at your own right arm. It's now the 7th of November. It's not now, now that you're watching this. And when you look at your right arm again at Christmas, 
when you're sitting on the Christmas table, it has a completely new arm. It has been broken down and built up again, at least the muscle. So there's a dynamic turnover with one to two percent per day of all your muscles. So muscle tissue is something very dynamic and it allows you to adapt to training, but also allows you to adapt to the loss of su sufficient physical activity. So how do we maintain muscle? By responding to anabolic stimuli. And there's two main anabolic stimuli. And the first one, I think most of here are uh, interested in that, is food intake, and particularly protein in the diet. Protein directly stimulates muscle protein synthesis. So the amino acids, as the building blocks of the proteins, are not simply building blocks of muscle protein. They're much more than simply building blocks. They're actually also signaling molecules. Signaling molecules that set off all these anabolic pathways that lead to muscle protein synthesis. And this is quite a different view than we had in the past. When you eat a meal with protein, you actually stimulate protein synthesis to a greater uh, extent than muscle protein breakdown, allowing you net muscle protein accretion. And when you do that three times or four times a day with different meals, you can maintain a normal muscle mass over a 24-hour period. And that's how we maintain our muscle without you actually noticing yourself. The idea is that when we become sick or when we become old, we become less sensitive to these anabolic properties of amino acids. When we provide protein, the anabolic response is less in the elderly or in the sick. And that's an interesting concept because that's, that's now referred to as anabolic resistance. But where does anabolic resistance reside? That's a difficult question, because it can reside on all these different places. It can reside at protein digestion. If you don't digest the protein, it's not going to do something for you. On the amino acid absorption, how much of the amino acids become available in the circulation and therefore to your muscle. How much of those amino acids will be transferred to the muscle, and that is regulated through the hormonal response. Your insulin after a meal will stimulate your perfusion of your tissues, allowing the amino acids to reach the muscle. And then they set off all the signaling proteins, and things can go wrong there as well. And then you get myofibrillar protein synthesis, so muscle protein synthesis. So anabolic resistance can reside on all these levels, and it depends on the individual and the state and or the disease. So we can study these things. And in our lab, we infuse people with labeled amino acids, check how much of those amino acids are in the circulation, and take multiple muscle biopsies with a uh, needle in the muscle to check how much of the amino acids are incorporated in skeletal muscle protein. And as such, it gives us a way to in measure in vivo muscle protein synthesis. However, it doesn't give you a good insight of how much of your protein that you ingest is actually used for muscle protein synthesis. And that's why we decided to infuse those labeled amino acids in a cow instead of a human. And I never thought that I was doing that kind of uh, research because, of course, I'm a human physiologist. But we started with infusing 40,000 euros worth of tracer in a cow.